to the Let's Talk Crypto podcast, where we discuss the latest Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset news. Hey everybody, hope you're all well. Today is the 6th of June, 2019, and this is the Let's Talk Crypto podcast. Today we are bringing you part two of what is Ethereum all about. Today we discuss the difference between the Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchain. We also touch on Ethereum scaling issues and how to sync a node. We also touch on orphan stale blocks and uncles. We discuss tokens and we also discuss use cases and competitors to the Ethereum blockchain. If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave us a like, a comment below, subscribe or share with your friends to get the word out there. With that said, let's get going. Welcome back everybody to part two of what is Ethereum all about. Today we joined with Omar. Hello guys, how are you doing? And Suyash. Hi everyone, please be back. And myself. What we didn't cover in the previous episode was a more detailed explanation on the differences between Bitcoin and Ethereum. They, they're both based on the blockchain sort of technology. They both use proof of work and they share a lot of different features. But if we look at the way that Bitcoin actually works as opposed to Ethereum at the block level, what are the key differences there in terms of how they work? Yes, I think before going into technical de for technical details too much between ethereum and bitcoin i feel like the more important question to answer is what can i expect out of ethereum if i'm holding ethereum and versus what if holding bitcoin with ethereum you are basically some people like to think even ethereum developers like to think that ethereum's native token ether is not money they try to try to say that it's not money because you're kind of you have a token for which is associated with a network that is used to build uh, applications whereas with bitcoin you're holding a coin which is primarily used as a medium of exchange and or store of value so the ether's main use case according to most people is not exchange of uh, medium of exchange but i feel like we're so early into the everything that you can hold both ether and bitcoin as a form of medium of exchange or or store of value because there is so much trading going on like currencies have been thousands of cryptocurrencies are out there but they're primarily being used to engage in speculative trading because we're kind of in the experimental stages and even with bitcoin scalability issues because it takes too long for transactions at times to confirm or settle and or there are other technical issues with the actual supporting hardware wallets or software wallets where where even experienced people admit that they feel apprehensive while they're engaging while do, they're doing normal bitcoin transactions so what i can say is that they both work on a blockchain. They, for now, they're both proof of work. However, Ethereum is Turing complete because you can program a wide range of a lot of functionality except for what Bitcoin's core code base has and lets you do. Even though like there are extensions now to Bitcoin, right? We can have a Lightning Network. We can have Liquid Network. We can have other kinds of side chains. But the base layer of bitcoin is just meant to transfer bitcoins and and to add to that i would say that the, the main differences uh, between bitcoin and ethereum stem from the fact that the use cases are different like bitcoin acts primarily as as digital money whereas ethereum the main aim of ethereum as we discussed in part one is primarily to allow people, developers, um, anyone to actually build decentralized apps. So in terms of the main differences in terms of uh, how blocks are stored or constructed in each of, of these blockchains, it's different because Bitcoin really, the way it stores, it creates the blocks and stores information only about transactions. Okay, so they do not have a specific state of the blockchain. Like you could not 
check a specific block and see, okay, someone has this specific balance in terms of Bitcoin. However, Ethereum is quite different in the, in the sense that uh, we can consider it to be like a state machine, what we call a state machine. Basically what it is that the whole Ethereum blockchain stores the actual state of the blockchain, meaning that at any given point in time, you can check a specific block and see, okay, this user has this amount of ether or this specific smart contract has been uh, has been deployed and what's its state. This is clearly defined in the Ethereum blocks and this is the main difference. And this is also one of the reasons why Ethereum is so huge in terms of the amount of information it stores on the blockchain compared to Bitcoin. So just to simplify that for me, in every single block, you've got the state of the entire blockchain up to that point uh, stored in that block, like the data. In other words, so it knows, for example, that XYZ token has been deployed and what the, the contract balance is for that particular token? Correct. Correct. Absolutely correct. And this is one of the main reasons why a lot of people have a lot of difficulty syncing their Ethereum nodes and it takes a really a long time compared yeah. to Bitcoin. And even if the blockchain size would have been the same, syncing Ethereum nodes is definitely going to take much, much longer than syncing Bitcoin nodes. Okay. I mean, it's just because it's storing a vast amount of data as compared to the Bitcoin. And how does Bitcoin work? Bitcoin just has a, a list of transactions that took place in time period and it sort of adds them to the block and then the next block comes out. So basically Bitcoin's working with unspent outputs and uh, Ethereum is sort of account based. Correct. And, and what, what's interesting is that Bitcoin is like, it offers the bare bones structure to make a system like Bitcoin actually work. And everything else is like accumulated by the software, like wallets. So when you open your Bitcoin wallet on your mobile, on your smartphone, you can see that, okay, you have this amount of balance in Bitcoin, you have done this and these transactions, but all this information are actually uh, calculated by the wallet or the software. This information are not like natively available on the Bitcoin blockchain. Okay. And I mean, I've tried to download the Ethereum blockchain recently, um, just in the normal sort of way of doing things. And it just felt like it was never going to complete. I eventually gave up. It, it seemed like the, the more and more blocks that were getting downloaded, the blockchain was growing faster than my computer could sync to it. I eventually gave up and deleted everything. Is there a solution for that? I would say not really. I mean, it depends on what you want to do with the node. Like if you want a full yeah. node, then definitely you need to download all the, all the blocks. And not only that, you will need to validate all the blocks. And, and this is going to take a lot and a lot of time. And it doesn't depend on your bandwidth. It actually depends on your input and output capabilities, like on your server. The more powerful server you have or computer, this will allow a quicker download and validation of, of, of the blockchain. However, if you, you, are just, you just want to push transactions, like you want to make payments on Ether or deploy smart contracts, then there is a, the option of setting up light nodes. Okay, so basically, as its name implies, it's basically a node that connects to the blockchain network, to the Ethereum blockchain, to allow you to push transactions. And it, it gives only the minimum information about states and any other information that you might require. So it really depends on the use cases, but the more like information you want to keep, to keep, the more time it will take to, to get synced. And, and as you said, was. A lot of the time, when you're syncing all these blocks, the blockchain is actually growing much faster than you're able to sync. Correct. Yeah. I mean, and then this fast syncing, what is that all about? Is that, is that what you're talking about where you do it on a light, uh, a light node, when you create a light node? Oh, that's, that's another option, actually. The fast sync is actually to sync only the, let's say, the latest a number of blocks and to get the latest states on the blockchain, on the Ethereum blockchain. So basically just take one part, one fraction of the whole blockchain and use it. But the problem is that even a fast sync is not actually fast because it can download the blocks quite quickly, but to have the, the state of the blockchain on a certain point of time, that is to know that these, these addresses have these balances 
and so on, they need to download all the information about the states. And this bit takes takes a lot a lot of time and you could see that okay you have reached a certain number of blocks like it's 60 blocks behind the actual number of blocks on the public ethereum blockchain but it's still taking like hours and days to get to the final step so this is what they are doing they are just downloading the state information for the whole blockchain and okay this one takes all right and what was something that... yeah go for it since you guys are talking about the challenge the technical challenges i just like to add to that is that if you zoom out of uh, zoom out of the main problem or technical issues the bigger picture i think is that these challenges might be due to the current limitations of the hardware and software design or an architecture that is currently available today and these sorts of limitations exist right now and in, and, and practically, but conceptually and theoretically, there are many, obviously, we're not like stagnant, we're moving forward and people are working to improve both hardware and software architecture. Sure. And, and uh, programming languages are also evolving. So, but at the same time, interestingly, we are even going to have to be concerned about things we're not even focusing too much on right now, I think. One of those things being the evolution and the progress being made by quantum computers. So like, we have to understand that whatever we're doing right now exists in binary. Either you're one or you're zero. There are like a couple of states. But to change that paradigm, to change even change that model, we can have quantum computers, which have been already decades, have already gone by that they, they worked on it. Eventually... We might have a problem where we might need to not just address the issues of scalability, but how do we guard against threats to like, like for example, with my Ethereum account, I have a public key and I have a private key. There's some people thinking that my, so my public key is what I use to, you know, I can share it with everybody, but my private passwords, my private key, I should not be sharing that. If I do, I'll lose all my money, right? So. These are other challenges because you people are saying that you can derive a private key from a public key. Like it could be possible with it, there's I mean they don't know for sure but these things can happen. Yeah. So but it, to be it, fair it, that could be quite a far way off from where we yeah, are now. Yeah. But but how far away is that or when that's going to happen it's it's debatable still yeah. and because obviously there's not one organization or one company working on these things. There's Google, there's IBM, there's military. Um, other, yeah. And so, so it's like, it's like an open experiment and it's like an open project. And, uh, but yeah. one thing that's important is with, with Ethereum, it's since it's decentralized, it would be a lot easier and almost completely automated to move centralized storage systems and servers over to quantum resistant because everything you, you like your password input your your login credentials will can be automatically up switched over whereas in decentralized everybody's kind of trying to take control of their own data so it's going to be more of a manual process and if you kind of don't do it or you miss don't do it you, you could be like it's more manual the way i see it with decentralized systems and trying to move over to a quantum resistant well i mean uh, i think the challenge is because it's decentralized you know there isn't one authority coming and saying okay guys come on let's all change over now ready one two three let's switch over to quantum resistant uh, software uh, and Whereas if it is centralized, you know, there's just somebody who takes the decision and flips a switch, basically. And yeah, yeah. the decentralized system, you have to coordinate. And that's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, there's been a lot of sort of contention and even in the Bitcoin community with, in terms of upgrading the network and, and whether they should increase the block size and hard fork is because they know it's very difficult to get, not only to get consensus, 
But once there is some sort of consensus, who knows how you get that consensus and what, how you poll it. But let's say you did get it. How do you get everybody to actually upgrade to the next uh, iteration or to the quantum resistant version or to increase the block size or whatever that, that change is, especially if it's a critical change that will be sort of consensus breaking, making everything before it redundant uh, or not work anymore. So yeah, I agree with you. You know, the decentralized nature, whilst it's good for many things, it, it, it makes it a lot more difficult to coordinate, how would I say, uh, friendly upgrades and positive changes to the network. One of them being oh, a, a, an emergency change when the quantum computer comes out and starts cracking people's wallets open. Well, and we can even forget about quantum computers for right now, even if we just take Ethereum, right? For example, recently, Ethereum Classic is supposed to be decentralized and ETC Labs decided to hard fork, do a backwards incompatible upgrade to Ethereum Classic. And they tried to do, they, they basically hard forked Ethereum Classic without, without the approval or taking, or taking without into Without any consensus from the community, they just took the decision and told the community to follow them. Right. So that created tension and, you know, there, there are other examples of contentious hard forks. So these problems are all, with decentralized technologies, these problems are already apparent. But that's not to say these problems can't be solved. Because we're, we're in developmental stages and eventually we'll figure things out, I think. Yeah. And there are other, I mean, while we're on it, we're not going to go too deep into it, but there are other projects working on decentralized governance, things like Tezos, which has it baked into the protocol mm. with its delegated proof of stake. But, you know, these things are very early days and there's a lot of new tokens out there that are, are trying different versions of, of, of on-chain governance that I'm sure will, will bear some fruit in the future. And you know what, they could probably be adopted by Ethereum or by Bitcoin if they prove to be useful later. Back on Ethereum, if we compare Ethereum to Bitcoin, when Bitcoin, you know, the longest uh, chain is, is normally the valid chain, right? The longest proof of work chain with, that's used the valid consensus rules is taken as Bitcoin. But it's important for people to realize that little forks happen all the time. You know, it, it does happen that two miners find a block at the same time and you get like a little fork in the network. But it, it generally doesn't go, you know, for, for many blocks. And then those transactions end up having to be put back into the mempool and go back into the original chain. So the longest proof of work wins and then, the, you know, the miners switch over to the correct chain. Now, it works a bit differently on Ethereum. They have things called orphan stale blocks and uncles. Suyash, could you just, without going into too much detail, make it basic, get us to understand what is meant by these things. Yes, yeah, so in my head, Bitcoin is a very unforgiving blockchain. Like you, like you said earlier, only the strong, like the longest blocks, uh, the longest blockchain actually wins. So uh, it's very unforgiving, even if you you manage to create the, um, generate a new block and you're a bit late in the game. So you lose all the computational work yet that you have done. And in some sense, this is quite similar to Ethereum because in Ethereum also, the longest chain always has precedence and the others, the other blocks which were created. But it does create, it does have some differences in the way these, these additional uh, blocks are managed. For example, in Ethereum, you have something called an orphan block. That is a block which was created at the same time another block was created, but which is not really included in the block, in the blockchain, because most, like the majority of miners have decided to follow another, another path with another block. So the block which has been created, which is totally valid, is now called an open block. And in some cases, now, which is quite rare actually, new blocks are created on the open blocks. These new blocks are called stale blocks because they are created, but they are actually quite, let's say, useless in the sense that they won't be used anywhere on the blocks. However, and this is quite similar to how Bitcoin works. However, on the Ethereum blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain actually gives, uh, provides a sort of incentive for miners to include these orphan blocks in their blocks which they have mined. The reason behind that is because even if these blocks are not used, they, have, they still have a purpose because they have helped to validate 
the network, they have helped to increase the security of the network. So these blocks are called uncles and they are sometimes integrated in the main block that has been mined. And actually miners are rewarded to include these, let's call it uncles, these uncle blocks in their blocks to say that, okay, not only that they have mined the blocks themselves, but other miners have actually mined other blocks and they have yeah, so this actually increases the, the whole security of the blockchain as a whole and and they get rewarded to add that because as you add more information the block costs more like to to validate than in terms of computation computational resources so it, they need to be incentivized to actually add any additional amount of information okay wow that was a, a very in-depth uh, explanation <laughs> i do get i do get a, i do get it to a certain degree a little bit better than when you started it kind of makes sense. It, it sounds to me that they've added more, that they've added more sort of events after the orphan block. Whereas with Bitcoin, you know, eventually the miners just switch back over to the longest chain. Okay. So another thing Ethereum is, is famous for is creating other tokens on its blockchain. So you've got Ethereum, which runs on the or Ether, which runs on on the Ethereum blockchain, and they've made it really easy for people to create contracts that are new tokens. So I like to think of it as like a, an airline company creates Voyager miles and their clients get paid these Voyager miles and ca for, for using their services, loyalty points, whatever you want to call it. And they can then use it in, the, in a certain ecosystem that where people accept these Voyager miles, whether it's for corporate gifts or for uh, hotels or for future air tickets. So what Ethereum's got, and I'm just using this analogy because it's easy to understand, is they've created a blockchain where people can go and make their own token, whether it's a Voyager mile or a, a loyalty point, whatever it may be, it could be another type of money. And, you know, this is created on top of the blockchain. So a developer can go in, set up certain parameters like supply, balance, give it a name and define a few other things, properties of, of their particular token. And this is called an ERC20 smart contract, I believe or token. And I think this is what really boosted the 2017 sort of proliferation of ICOs and fundraising activities on the Ethereum blockchain. It is itself a great fundraising mechanism and the utility token, as they as they call it, has become very popular. And we have covered, you know, the things that came after it, security tokens and IEOs. What do you see as as being the the next step in in these uh, ERC twenty tokens? Are there new versions of them coming out, or any exciting use cases that people are actually using them nowadays? Usability and. Uh... Practical, being practical, that's a good question. Right now, what I see is a lot of mainly people, whether you want to like get into that, I mean, whether, whether you agree with that or not, a lot of people think this way, is that there are a lot of tokens, there are a lot of coins, but not always with the intention of introducing a legitimate use case. It's a lot yeah. of it is driven by, a lot of it is driven by, hey, let's just launch a token, whether we need it or not, let's just make up a problem whether it exists or not just so that we can pocket some money and move on so yeah. we, we you can you can you can attach any crazy use case to to a token even though it's not even doesn't even make sense and you can combine all the buzzwords blockchain big data iot which people have done i can show you AI. Examples. you can bundle all that into to a project whether whether uh, you need it or not i can give examples of projects that have done that and they also give you examples of projects that have done that and failed miserably in the end and their owner or their founders are so embarrassed that they've actually removed all attempted to uh, remove all like evidence or like any tracks of where they actually tried to launch something like that. And not all of them were scams. Not all of them were like trying to rob people, but it, a lot of them had to do with, Hey, look what, well, look what I can do. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take over the e-commerce industry, or I'm going to do this, uh, this, this and that, but not being realistic in their expectations. And, sure. uh, but at the same the end, time, at the same time, yeah. there are those who had sort of good intentions and genuinely felt they had something and perhaps the, the the product to market fit wasn't there or maybe they're too early or 
uh, there just wasn't a, an appetite for that type of product. It was the wrong platform. And, and yes, I agree. You know, there are those that are, I wouldn't in, say inverted commas scammers, but there are those who, who probably knew up front that, you know, they, they were just trying to do a cash grab. But yeah, you know, I, I, I do feel sorry for, for those that got swept up amongst the scammers or the, the people who, uh, who were in it to make a fast buck because there, are, there probably are some good projects, some great ideas that, that maybe it's too early for them, you know, not the right product to market fit or they didn't have the, the right marketing behind them or the right skills to, to achieve what the, their vision was. I can't think of any yeah. right now, but if I could think of an example, I would. I, but I do know of some projects that are running. I just don't know to what extent they're being successful. The first one that comes to mind is that auger. That it's a prediction market. I think. I think that is running at the moment. I don't know to what extent it's successful. Yeah. Just just to elaborate a bit on that, I think that um, ERC20 tokens are quite an interesting use case because when you try to see the big picture, it's like previously when you had to raise funds for your startup or business or your idea, anything like that. It was quite rest in some countries it's very restricted in terms of where you can get the funding and things like that and eos t20 actually shows the power of decentralization that is even before like the authorities or the regulators could actually do something and actually comprehend what was going on there were so many companies trying to raise funds and democratizing all this investment investor and business relationship and this shows that okay um, maybe it doesn't go necessarily in the right direction, but it opens the door for new alternatives, new options to choose from. And ERC20 is actually a standard which was which was created by someone called Fabian Vogelsteller. Okay, and the idea behind it was like, okay, so everyone is going to create their own tokens, but how do you, how does it interoperate? like how to make sure that one token can be exchanged with another one and, and so on. So a standard had to be created and the result was ERC20 tokens. And the basic idea behind these standards is to set up like specific functions, standard functions that are common to all these tokens. Okay, and which will allow these tokens to interoperate and allow actually like exchanges and so on to easily onboard them and facilitate transactions. Okay. All right, and there's other types of standards. There's the ERC-223. Correct, it's ERC-223. That is just an improvement, the right? Or Correct. Correct. The main reason ERC-223 was created actually was to uh, cater for like a very serious bug that was present on the ERC-20 token. For example, if you were sending ERC-20 tokens to someone who had a valid Ethereum address, it was fine. They could receive the tokens and actually spend it and, and do whatever they want, wanted. But if you wanted to send an ERC-20 token, to a smart contract address, which can easily be done, it's the same same principle. The problem was that these ERC20 tokens were locked in a specific Ethereum address, and like it was indefinitely locked, so you couldn't do anything about it. So okay. this was, this was a major bug because a lot of companies lost they lost these tokens due to this uh, due to this bug. So the ERC20 okay. came forward and corrected this by adding like more safeguards. Okay, so it, basically a, bu a bug fix. And I, I believe there was another one called ERC777, if I'm not mistaken. What was that? Correct. Yeah. So, so this one, is, the use case is, is a bit different. It's like, it's what we call a fungible token. Okay, so the ERC777, this thing is a bit different in the sense that it's called a fungible token. So it has different use cases and like it basically focuses on adoption like for a wide range of transaction. So its use case is different, but basically these are like different standards which are created to cater for different needs in the market. Okay, but it can be used in a similar way, right? Or not? Correct. Okay. So in the end, we've got it's what I see here is we're not what I can see here is that we're not reinventing we're not reinventing basic things like 
people will still have the same basic needs. They'll still need products and services and you will need to exchange some form of money and just like there are categories and classification in a non-crypto blockchain world in a crypto blockchain world we we as humans as people doing transactions and establishing business relations between each other as people of that people of people doing that kind of stuff, we need classification systems, whether it's crypto or not, because we, we need to be able to figure out, all right, what am I, if I have a token, what can the token do? If I'm going to create a token, I need to have it adhere to some sort of guidelines. I need for it to fit some kind of format. Even when we were writing a document, right, we decide at that point, is this going to be a Word document or is this going to be a an Excel spreadsheet or a uh, Microsoft Access database, SQL type database, an HTML file, et cetera, et cetera. We, we, we cannot just, just arbitrarily like not define the data type, not define and then just start producing data and then start, start to, to transact with that data or upload, download, whatever it is. So just like you would have an HTML file or a Word file, you need to set the format for your token beforehand. Yeah, that makes sense. That simplifies it nicely. So what are some of the best use cases or the most well-known use cases that Ethereum is known for at the moment? I, and I don't mean they're being massively adopted, but some of the use cases out there. Yeah, I would say one of like the most popular use cases and actually running applications, running uh, decentralized applications, it's called, it's called FLANs. So basically, FLANs is a marketplace for jobs. What it allows you to do is, if you're looking for people to do a certain specific kind of job or you're hiring freelancers, it's a marketplace where freelancers can post their, um, let's say, their resumes and things like that, and you can employ them via this decentralized platform. So it started as a zero percent service platform. So you you don't have to pay any any commission or things like that. You directly pay the people who are working for you. So okay. it's basically the, the decentralized, a real decentralized application. Okay, so it's like replacing freelancer.com or Fiverr or Upwork as the middleman and, and using the Ethereum sort of decentralized nature to manage the, the transaction between a, a freelancer or a worker and an employer. Okay, cool. And what about some of the other applications there are? I mean, there's one that's got quite a lot of criticism, and that is CryptoKitties, some sort of game of sort. And I think that the tokens that they created, or I don't know what they are, collectibles, are unique, unlike the normal sort of thing with tokens and crypto tokens or coins, where you want them to be fun fungible, one's replaceable for another. Uh, CryptoKitties, I think it's called, make unique tokens, right? So when you talk about crypto kitties, there are ups. I think we would all agree there's upsides to that. There are a lot of things that were learned from that and other similar games and projects that were launched and a lot of pros and cons that came about from that. But they, it is on a special type of token that it's not ERC-20, correct? Right. I, I think it was like, an, it's a 721 ERC. Was it? I mean, I can tell you right now. Yeah, yeah, sure. What, what I'm getting at is that, it, you know, it has different properties to, to the ERC-20 in that one yeah. token yeah. is unique to another token. So it creates that, that scarcity in terms of units. So... If you've got one of these tokens, it isn't like another one of the, the tokens. They're different, and, and that's what makes them collectible, which I find you know, very interesting because if, if they could figure out a way of, of doing that and attaching it to physical goods or you know, embedding them in, in physical goods, maybe that would be a way of you know, sort of you know, beating counterfeiting and things like that. Ethereum yeah. versus EOS. What you know, yeah. we've spoken about Ethereum versus Bitcoin, but in reality, Bitcoin, when it was first built, wasn't intended to be a platform that you build all sorts of applications on. It was, I think, its its first intention was to be a a way of transferring value, storing and transferring value without a middleman. Whereas Ethereum, as like we've said, is is a decentralized platform for building decentralized applications. Whatever that may be, your imagination can come up with all sorts of things that you can decentralize, and then you can build it on the Ethereum block. Blockchain. EOS, a much new blockchain, also built on the premise of, of having an application layer that you can build apps on top of. What are the differences between them? 
if I may start on that one, is in my opinion, having covered extensively both EOS and Ethereum, what I can say is that, of course, EOS is a newer blockchain. It was launched after Ethereum. And Ethereum primarily benefits from the network effect, meaning it's been around longer. It's a more established network. More people are familiar with application design and development for now on Ethereum. But that's not to say that EOS isn't making uh, progress. Because it clearly, according to what I think, EOS is uh, can argument can be made it's better and compared to ethereum in many ways for example they just introduced uh, software development kits for java eos so you can you can do plug and play you can use java which is pretty widely used whereas in, on ethereum you're you're when, uh, at least when you're writing smart contracts you are have to use solidity which having done application development before i, I don't think it's like that much of a learning curve like you can yes you can learn solidity if you've learned other programming languages you can start using solidity it's not i don't find it to be that hard so you you can start there's not much of a learning curve if you want to start ethereum development or if you want to do e development on eos and briefly if we just talk about the consensus algorithm for now ethereum is proof of work so but they want to transition to proof of stake and EOS is already using a version of proof of stake, which is called uh, delegated proof of stake. And I, I, I think I'll let Suresh, Suresh talk about what that is and go from there. On mine, I think that the main difference between Ethereum and EOS is based on their consensus algorithms. Like Ethereum currently uses proof of work, which is something which is a well-tested, stable and robust consensus algorithm, but which has certain limitations. So one of the most popular, I would say popular limitations is that Ethereum is able to accommodate only uh, around 15 transactions per second. And it, it's very few, like if you want, if, if you compare what Ethereum wants to do in terms of being, as we discussed in episode one, the world computer, it's, it, it's too little. Uh, on the other hand, EOS uses the delegated proof of stake, which is very different, and but but it can serve up to ten thousand transactions per second, and that's a lot compared to what Ethereum can offer. Of course, there is some debate up on on on, on this exact figure, but let's say let's say that currently it's it's definitely the case that EOS is much more scalable than Ethereum. However, it is bring forward a certain aspect of blockchains in terms of decentralization. Ethereum is what we can consider more decentralized than EOS in the sense that EOS actually uses a certain number of, I won't say centralized, but a certain number of people, organizations, which kind of control the network. So that level of decentralization is less than Ethereum. However, this does bring certain advantages, as I mentioned earlier, the number of transactions, scalability, and, and ease of deploying applications. And even in EOS, we don't have, we don't need to pay for transactions in the traditional sense. So each of them has maybe the same use cases, but has certain advantages and disadvantages. That's interesting. There's two things I picked out of there that, that stand out for me. You said, no, you don't have to pay for transactions. I don't... I need to understand them a bit better. And the other thing was the advantages of them being more centralized or fewer sort of entities involved. I've heard that they are able to reverse transactions or recover funds if, if there's a case of theft or mistake. How does that work? And if so, I mean, is that is that really an advantage or how do you guys see that panning out? Well, in terms of the transaction cost, when you're using Ethereum, when you're doing any kind of transaction, for example, you are sending Ether to someone else or you're deploying a smart contract or you're simply saving any kind of information on the blockchain, you have to pay what we call gas. So gas is basically a unit to, to compute how much you need to pay pay the, the blockchain to actually save an, a piece of information. So basically, uh, at the end of the day, it translates to Ether. So the idea, the general idea is this. If you want to store information on the Ethereum public blockchain, you have to pay for that, which is, makes absolute sense because this information needs to be 
added to blocks and and miners need to use the computational resources to mine these blocks so it all spans out like you pay for transactions and these these payments are used to reward miners on the other hand eos uh, works quite differently in the sense that transaction costs are uh, don't really exist instead of using gas users actually lease their tokens to cover bandwidth to pay for transaction so it's quite different from from how ethereum works but it's also based on the fact that they use red consensus algorithms the second question was you mentioned that it, it could be seen as being more centralized which is it, you know it has certain benefits and, and certain sort of drawbacks but one of the things i've heard about eos is that it's possible to recover stolen funds or it's possible to stop like for example if if you send money to the wrong person it could be reversed perhaps do we know anything about that is it true and if it's true is that a good thing or a bad thing look it's it, i don't like to, to to take positions i do in my mind have i take positions but at the same time i feel like i don't know enough and i don't think anyone most other people don't know well enough all variables and all things that need to be taken into consideration before making a generalization or definite statement that one thing is better than the other or this do you, do you guys see what i'm trying to say like sure uh, but is it yeah. is it true that you are able to reverse transactions or recover funds i think is a, a softer way of of approaching it do you think that's yeah 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 of course uh, theoretically and tech uh, practically to some level or some extent that's possible and it has obviously been done in certain, on certain blockchains but it's it's a an ideology if you want the blockchain to remain uncorruptible immutable if integrity of data whole has pr- priority over loss of funds if integrity of data has priority over loss of funds then you would say that no we should not be rolling back transactions but if a recovering funds teaching bad actors a lesson is more important to you then you can roll back and I, and i'd love to know how it works and how it's arbitrated and who makes the decisions behind which ones do get rolled back and which ones don't would that's where it gets tricky and then you get accused of not being decentralized you get accused of being maybe even in a cartel you know it it goes to what is decentralized what is centralized people can't even agree on that so yeah and the the way i i see it also is that if you if you compare the consensus algorithms because at the end of the day a blockchain is defined by its rules and we could have like good actors and bad actors um, participating in the blockchain but the way a blockchain works is defined by by its consensus algorithm so if we take the case of eos it uses a delegated proof of stake so just to give you an idea how a delegated proof of stake works I mean, in in the case of eos basically eos has 25 21 block miners Okay so these block miners they actually they are responsible to create all the block blocks producers. in the blockchain sorry block producers block producers correct so 21 block producers and these block producers they have the responsibility to create all the blocks on the blockchain which is very different from how ethereum and blockchain works because we don't have a set number of, of block producers or block miners and anyone can have the chance to actually do to create a new block but in eos this is fixed however is when when you stop up until there it does give a very centralized uh, like feeling to eos but to go one step further these 21 block producers are actually kind of controlled by uh, what we call voters so voters of these uh, persons organizations which hold eos okay and they have voting rights to actually determine which of these 21 block producers can actually produce create new blocks or not so basically it's definitely less decentralized than what ethereum or bitcoin are offering but still then i'm um, reversing transactions although it's it's more probable that it will occur in eos than in ethereum and, and bitcoin it's still something like very difficult to happen because at the end of the day if people are reversing transactions on eos it is like create a lose 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 situation for everyone it creates a trust issue on the blockchain on the eos blockchain and at the end of the day everyone is going to lose unless like except for a few bad players
Sure. I mean, the you know, game theory still applies just like it does with Ethereum or Bitcoin, where, you know, reversing a transaction is could become more reputationally expensive for not only the system and for the participants involved than what the transaction is worth. And I think that sort of game theory keeps the balance in play, you know, between the different actors within the system. And at the end of the day, like Omar says, you know, decentralized how decentralized, you know, is three people enough? Is four people enough? Is it, or is it 40 different nodes or is it a thousand? Or where do you sort of draw the line? Where's the, where does it become decentralized? You know, is it, is 29 enough or is 210 the right amount? You know, and if you look at even Bitcoin or Ethereum, you'll find that although there's a lot of smaller miners, the, the mining is concentrated to only a handful of the biggest mining pools, which in itself is, is a level of centralization. Is there anything else you guys want to just bring in here with regards to what we're talking about now or add to it or you think would be useful to segue into from what we've just spoken about? I think it's, it's, it's good in terms of uh, comparison Ethereum against, against EOS. I think we covered all the points. Is there anything else you want to talk about when it comes there, to there? There, there's a like, there's. I think there's just way too much to talk about, and it's it's an interesting mm-hmm. conversation, and it's a an evolving conversation, and nobody has all the knowledge, nobody has all the best ideas. It's mostly, and we're doing right now. If it, most sensible people will tell you that. What we're doing right now is, is a lot of it is experiment and there are no established best practices, established industry best standards because we are all learning and we're all trying to, to improve. In a way, in a way, if we want to compare it to the internet, if you, because a lot of people do, what we're doing basically right now is we're kind of at the stage of the internet where we're just about to launch our first web browser. So we're like working with different web browsers. It's is Internet Explorer good right now? Is Firefox good right now? Or Netscape Navigator, which kind of went away. You guys remember, and it's like a long time ago. Or, or like yeah. if you want to talk to social media, we're we're just about to maybe discover MySpace. So we're not even at Facebook yet, and we're kind of we're just figuring out what things to do here. Like EOS and Dan Larimer. He had launched Steemit, and that was like ex- increasingly centralized. And it was a block; it's a blockchain-based social media network. But they can't make things decentralized while offering services, good services, at the same time. It's a it's a hard thing to do. People are critical of Larimer's action, Dan Larimer's actions, but I think these people need to be given we need to be more lenient in how we judge people or evaluate people like Vitalik Buterin. I mean, these guys are kind of like leading the way they, we cannot take away from what they're doing because they're going, they have already gone into uncharted territory and they are working on things which have never been done before. So like when, after, for example, after MySpace came a lot of work and evolution for, for to produce Facebook, to produce Twitter, to produce Instagram, WhatsApp, the list goes on. But you can't just get there in like one day. Like Rome was not built in one day. So the best thing to do would be real to stick, be reasonable and realistic and not to in like if you want to invest in cryptocurrencies, sure. But most people say, okay, you want to limit your investment to maybe one to to 5% of your investment portfolio. Thank you for listening to another episode of Let's Talk Crypto. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, please leave us a comment below, like or share with your friends, and let's get the word out there. On our next episode, we'll delve deeper into the Ethereum technicals and speak a bit more about some of the challenges they face in terms of scaling. Hope you all have an amazing weekend and we'll catch up next week.